Welcome, and in this video course, we are looking at the CyberOps Associate version one course. This course is going to cover the skills and knowledge needed for successfully handling the tasks and duties, responsibilities of an associate level security analyst working at a security operations center. The goal of this video series is to help prepare learners for the Cisco 200-201 certification. That's focusing on understanding the Cisco Cybersecurity Operation Fundamentals course known as CBROPS. Module three, Windows Operating System. So we're gonna be looking at Windows OS a little more in depth. We're gonna look at the history, look at the architecture, the operations, how to configure and monitor certain components and we're gonna wrap it up with some basic Windows security. So let's jump into Windows history. First version of Windows was some form of command terminal, disk operating system, or DOS. It basically was a command terminal only. There wasn't really a graphical component. There was no mouse driven. DOS was also a file system which provided the way uh, the organization for storage on the disk. But Microsoft combined their platform, MS, Microsoft, and DOS to have that command terminal for people. That way you could start creating programs or manipulating objects and data files and folders and whatnot, still using the DOS commands, but having at least a basic understanding of what's going on. And again, this was all through the command terminal not through a graphical interface. So this was done in the uh, early 80s. So earlier versions of Windows that did have a GUI or graphical user interface, basically they ran on top of MS-DOS and from there that became Windows 1 and that was in 85. And from there they built on top of that platform. All newer versions of Windows were built on what's called the new technologies or NT based concept. This operating system itself is in direct control of the device and its hardware, not having that middleman, not having that DOS as a middleman. Realistically today, almost everything can be accomplished through either a terminal or through a GUI. It just depends on your preference. How do you access the command terminal? If you're in Windows, most version of Windows, you can just go to start, type CMD, or start, click on run, and type CMD. If you have a newer version of Windows, you may have a different command terminal as well, known as PowerShell. And that's way outside the scope of what we're talking about today, but just know that the command terminal is still being developed. It's not dead, it's not dying it's always evolving, always growing. All right, so the assumption is you know basic command terminal commands. Things like if you wanna list the directory contents, it's DIR. If you wanna change a directory, it's CD and the location. If you wanna copy or delete, you know how to do that. Uh, same thing with uh, making a directory, deleting a directory, renaming a directory, and helping. Again, we're not covering the in-depth portions of the commands. It's more of a, do you understand what they do? And are you familiar enough with them to navigate a terminal? So after DOS, after MS-1, we've essentially had 20 different major releases of Windows that are based off of that NT-based platform. Multiple versions of Windows have different components, things like workstation or professional or uh, some type of server and advanced server. So it really just depends as they grow what the purposes are and more and more of them are becoming multi-purpose built. Microsoft is detecting certain niches and they fill that. For example, you can have a, uh, a kiosk version of Windows you can have a version of Windows that's scaled back to run a ATM machine. Not a full-fledged version of Windows XP or not a full-fledged version of Windows 7, but enough of it so that it has the core components of Windows. 
Windows can also be either a 32-bit operating system or a 64-bit operating system. So what does that mean? Basically, what are the instruction sets? How large of an instruction can the processor handle? We can have a 64-bit instruction set or we can have a 32-bit instruction sets. Normally, you can scale back, you can always go backwards. So if you're a 64-bit processor, you can process both 64 and 32-bit instructions. However, a 32-bit system cannot handle larger instruction sets. And keep in mind, the instruction sets are anything that you send to the processor. The larger the resources it will call, the larger the jobs, the larger the address space typically. So you'll notice more and more operating systems are moving towards the 64-bit version as opposed to the 32-bit version. Almost all major releases of Windows has become more refined. They've had more features. They've developed more content. Interesting enough, Windows 10 was the last main version of Windows that will be sold. So rather than purchasing new operating systems, you'll just be upgrading different versions of Windows 10. That's pretty common with other mainstream publishers like Apple and certain Linux distros. You don't normally upgrade and purchase the upgrade. You just buy one operating system and all the updates are now free. So what are some of the major, uh, major releases? Windows 7, Server, Windows 8, Windows 10, Server 2016, Server 2019, and so forth. And you'll notice all of them have multiple versions. So Windows 7 had Starter, Home Basic, Home Premium, Professional. Windows 10 had Home, Pro, Pro Education, Education, IoT Core, Mobile, uh, Enterprise, and so forth. And even the server lines have Foundation, Essential, Standard, Data Center, Premium, Storage, Storage Server, and so forth. So all major versions of Windows have multiple versions that specialize to do certain tasks. All right, so let's look at some of the details. So we have a GUI. This is gonna be our Windows 10 desktop. That's our desktop is essentially the home screen when you first log into Windows. By default, a fresh installation of Windows only has the recycle bin and maybe Microsoft Edge on the desktop. Everything else uh, is, not, is not there. Those are the two main icons. The icons are just the objects that are on the desktop that are like little shortcuts. You can create objects like a folder or files and save them on your desktop for ease of access, but for the most part, it's more about how you want to do it. Bottom right hand side of the desktop is the notification area. The center is typically known as the quick launch area. The entire bottom bar is known as the task bar. And then on the left will be the start menu, the windows flag, and next to that a search window. That could also be Cortana based off of your settings. The recycle bin is the temporary location when you delete something. When you delete a file, it goes to the recycle bin. When you go and clear out the recycle bin, because you need to do that, the computer doesn't do it automatically, you delete the files. There are ways to recover the files, but again, that's way outside the scope of what we are doing today. But this is a nutshell of understanding the GUI for Windows 10. Windows does support multiple users as well as multiple virtual desktops. So you can actually have multiple desktops for multiple purposes. For example, when I'm doing writing, I have one virtual desktop that has all of my writing, my shortcuts for my writing, my resources for my writing. I have another virtual desktop that allows me just to have like more of a general display. And depending on what I'm doing, I can switch between those virtual desktops. So Windows 10 is definitely growing in its ability. We can manipulate files and other objects 
These are normally uh, done by playing with the context menu. If you click on an object, left click or right click, you get different options. If you right click on an object, you can actually get a select option. You also have the ability to look at properties of that object as well. And an object could be a folder, could be a file, could be anything. All operating systems are vulnerable to certain types of attacks. That's just, it is what it is. There are hundreds of millions of lines of code, and some of the code strung together have a vulnerability. As vulnerabilities are found, they are patched and dealt with. If an attacker knows a vulnerability and no one else knows, those are called zero days. No one else knows about them. The interesting part is if you are able to find an exploit or a flaw or weakness, you can exploit them. And part of what we do in ethical hacking is understanding how to exploit a system that we control so we can look at it from the perspective of someone trying to attack us. If we know how they're getting in, we can find ways to protect those entrances. Exploited systems mean an attacker can have access to them. So the goal here is to reduce the ability for attackers to gain that foothold. So to take advantage of a system's vulnerability, an attacker must use a technique or a tool to exploit the vulnerability. And there's tons of tools out there for automating the exploitation process. You don't have to be a whiz to do this. You don't have to be a programmer to do this. A lot of the exploit tools are wizard driven. You say, I want to do number one. Hit number one. Number one does a task. You can have it so it's dumb simple or stupid simple so that you don't really have to do a whole lot. Attackers can use vulnerability uh, to, to even act as an old fashioned outside the way that the, the operating system is designed. It's not always about the technology portion for vulnerabilities. Sometimes it's about being able to get a hold of the user and do it that way. What's the purpose? I mean, who, who cares if we're doing vulnerabilities? Who cares if an attacker gains access to a system? Well, the general goal is to gain, uh, gain unauthorized access to a computer so that you can elevate your permissions or so that you could steal data. The two main purposes of being able to attack someone, el escalation and data theft or espionage. Those are huge. Some common vulnerabilities are things like viruses or malware, ransomware with encryption. If I'm able to encrypt your data and hold it ransom and make you pay me, I make money that way. You could also have uh, services that are running that are non-functional in the background. At the end of the day, security policies should be able to prevent a lot of vulnerabilities from coming in. They can outline things like software updates or virus scans or what types of programs can be on the computer. They can also go even further about how to train your users. But the policies are only good if they are enforceable and actually checked to make sure they're doing their job. Other uh, recommendations could be things like having firewalls, whether it's a hardware network-based firewall or even just a software-based firewall. Those are important. They filter traffic coming into your computer or into your network and as they leave. Files and sharing or object permissions. When you have an object, whether a folder or an object, in Windows, by default, everyone has access to it. You can manipulate these so that not everyone has access. I see a lot of people that don't truly understand share permissions, so they do everyone. Everyone has full access. But that's a security concern. You normally want to only have those that are authorized or should be authorized 
access to those systems. Lastly, we have things like logins. And logins are going to be either logging in as an administrator to do web browsing, or you log into account, but you have no password, or you have a super weak password. Both of those are no-goes. You should have strong passwords. In Windows 7 and above, even logging in as an admin, they made it so that when you log in, you're given a user token instead of an admin token. That way, even if you are logging in as a admin, it's not as damaging if your account is compromised. Can be, but isn't necessarily. Realistically, when you're doing work on a computer, if you do not need admin access, get into the habit of logging in as a standard user. That way, if your user is compromised, it's not compromising everything. Whereas if you log in as an admin, the possibility is there. All right, so moving on, let's talk about the Windows architecture and operations. So in Windows, we have what's called a hardware abstraction layer, or HAL. Basically, this is a software that handles all the communication between the kernel and all of the hardware. We, the user, do not get to interact with the hardware directly. The kernel is going to be the core portion of the operating system that has control over the entire system. The kernel also handles all of the input-output requests and all really resource requests, memory as well, as well as all its peripherals. The basic architecture is what we see in this design. So let me grab my pen. We, users, deal with these applications. Applications will make calls to a API. The API will actually uh, go ahead and function between the kernel. The kernel, when it determines it needs to access hardware, will send it to the abstraction layer, or the HAL. The HAL will decide how that hardware is actually utilized. If we're talking storage, all storage is going to be part of the file system. But the interesting part here is we never get to directly deal with the hardware. We are not organized or fast enough. So the entire system focuses on taking our requests, our input, processing them, and then uh, figuring out the appropriate output based off of our inputs. There are two different modes in which the CPU may operate. The computer has the installed uh, or the user mode and the kernel mode. You'll see them here. User mode, kernel mode. Installed apps running in user mode as well as the operating system code will be running in the kernel mode. All system software runs in this mode. All user uh, software in our user mode. All of the code that runs in the kernel must use the same address space. So we have dedicated memory space just for our kernel. When the user mode code runs, it's granted its own restricted access space by the kernel. It says what resource you're allowed, what resource you're going to be using. And as uh, information is written to and from those alloc uh, the memory allocation spaces, they may actually reclaim some of the space depending on what processes are being done. What I mean by that is you open up Chrome. Chrome opens up, it sends it to memory, it's the granted space in memory. When you're done using Chrome and you close it, that memory space goes away. Since we talked about file system and storage just a little bit, we need to understand the file system that is used. In Windows, we have several different Sorry, in computing, we have several different types of file systems. In Windows, we have things like FAT or NTFS, but that's only one type of file system. Two, FAT and NTFS, so there's two different types. But if we're talking uh, partition styles on a USB drive or partition styles in a Mac or a, uh, an Apple-based machine, they're all going to be slightly different. 
So first of all, a file system is how we organize the, the data on a storage device. The storage device could be a flash drive, could be a hard drive, could be an optical uh, medium, doesn't matter. All we're talking about here is how we structure that information. XFAT is pretty simple, has limitations, size and speed. However, XFAT is the evolution of FAT16 and FAT32. Most large USB drives will be XFAT. Nice thing is XFAT can go between Linux, between Mac, can be and even Windows machines. Again, common, large flash drives. The HFS is a Mac proprietary one. Although it's not supported by Windows, Windows is able to read the data from a Apple partition. XFAT, all devices can read and write to it. We have Linux, which will use the EXT or the extended file system. Again, not supported by Windows, but we are able to read data from. NTFS is the most common. NTFS has been around numerous years and is slowly being replaced by something called REFS outside the scope of today, but NTFS is the predominant, win the predominant Windows file system. This is how it stores its data. NTFS also supports things like file attributes, things like permissions, things like sharing, uh, read-write access, things like that. Normally, other OSs cannot write to NTFS. They can only read from NTSF. So if you want to write to NTFS, you normally have to have a special driver to do that. So that sets our file system. That's just part of it. NTFS is the most important file system you need to know about in the Windows realm. NTFS will format, will create a very specific structure on the storage device. And again, the storage device is used for file storage, but other things have to be prepared. Things like table for recording locations. On every storage device, you will have what's called a partition boot sector. This is the first 16 sectors of the drive, and it contains the location of what's called the master file table. The last 16 sectors will contain a copy of the boot sector as well. So this master file table is the table that will contain the location of all the files and directories on the partition. When you copy a file to a storage device, every piece of that file has to be recorded. That way, if it's in multiple locations on the storage device, the table, the master file table, will know exactly where it's at. Also, security permissions will be happening at this time as well. We have system files. These are going to be hidden files that store information about the volume, as well as other file attributes on that storage medium. We also have the storage area or the file area, and that's going to be the main area of the partition where the files and directories are going to be stored. When you format a partition, the previous data is still there. Normally, when you delete something, you actually just delete the contents out of the master file table. As long as the data hasn't been overwritten yet, the data is still present. When we save something, it's not always just the file. There's attributes, things like the name of the file, timestamps, last access, things like that. The data which the file contains is stored in a attribute called dollar sign $data. This is known as the data stream. If we're looking at NTFS, we can look at alternate data streams, ADSs, and they can be connected to the file as well. An attacker could store malicious code with a ADS that can then be called from a different file. In NTFS file systems, a file with an ADS is identified after the name with a colon and ADS. So this file name will indicate the ADS calls as well as the associated file that's called on its behalf. 
So here you'll notice we have our test file. We have ADS. And there's the data string. So now that we kind of talked about storage, we talked about the hardware functionality, how does the computer boot? You hit the power button, but what happens? Well, first thing that happens is up here, power buttons hit. Once you hit the power button, the processor will initialize. That will start a chain reaction and it will actually go through the BIOS initiation. That powers on the processor, that powers on all of the subcomponents that are needed. If it's not using the traditional BIOS, you could have a newer uh, motherboard or a newer computer that uses the Unified Extended Firmware Interface or UEFI. So when you hit the power button, instead of loading BIOS, it may load the UEFI. Doesn't really matter. Essentially, they do the same thing. The initiation process will begin. It will load some form of boot record, whether it's the MBR, the master boot record from BIOS, or the EFI files from the UEFI. Essentially, this says this is the hardware that needs to start. Start it. MB, uh, if we're doing our BIOS after MBR, MBR will actually initiate a post, a power on self test. This will verify the critical hardware components are present. Memory, processor, video, power. Those are the four things that are tested before it's allowed to continue. What happens is once it is allowed to continue, it will find the boot manager. The boot manager basically will take data from the uh, storage device known as BCD or boot configuration data. And from there, it will determine how to load windows. If it is resuming from a hibernation, it will run the res, uh, winresume.exe. If it is running from a fresh boot, it will load the winload.exe. And from there, the winload.exe will also use the kernel mode code signing, KMCS, to make sure all of the drivers are appropriate before loading the NTOS kernel.exe. Basically, that starts the Windows kernel and setting up the HAL options. From there, we load our SMSS, and all of this is before our login screen even occurs. If all of this is functional, it gives us to an interaction login screen. If hibernation is what is being restored, the winresume.exe will load the hyperfile.sys and then from there it will give you the login screen. So we already walked you through the process of getting to the boot manager, taking data from the boot manager and loading the BCD, from the BCD how it loads the rest of the components. It's important to note that a computer that uses the EFI stores the boot code in the firmware basically making it a little more secure. So there are two really important registry keys that are used to start applications and services. These are gonna be the hives or the groups for our registry. H key local machine, H key current user. These are two of the main registry items that will be loading when our user logs in. The local machine We'll have the Windows configuration about services and what to do when the computer starts. The current user portion, the current user 
will be logged in is going to be information about the current user, about the services they're using, and start only when the user logs in to that different computer or log into that system. Keep in mind that different entries in the registry locations will define the services and the applications and kind of what they can do. The registry is basically the group of configuration that allows Windows to function. When we are uh, dealing with the registry, we can have things like run, run once, run service, run service once, or use uh, user initiation. These entries are manually entered into the registry, but it's a lot faster to use something like msconfig. msconfig can modify the registry directly on your behalf, though this is also used to view and change some of the startup options and older versions of Windows. If you use msconfig for Windows 10, it doesn't work. You get the traditional general boot services startup. You get these tabs, but they don't all function the same way. The general tab has three main uh, ways to start Windows. The normal startup, that will load everything. Diagnostics will be basic drivers and services, or you can do more of a selective startup. Basically, you can say what to load. Maybe you want startup items. Maybe you want services. Maybe you don't, maybe you don't want services. So part of this is going to let you be more selective. The boot portion is going to be our path to our BCD. This is going to say where to boot Windows, and if you have multiple OSs, or if you have like a dual boot based system, it's going to be here as well. Also, you can change the way that Windows boots. In earlier versions, you had safe mode. Well, you could tap F8 while Windows was loading, and it would give you those options. With Windows 10, you don't get those anymore. But using msconfig, you can still boot to a safe mode, you can still do everything you could with previous versions of Windows and the boot options. Safe mode, minimal, command shell, safe mode with networking, maybe you don't want a, a GUI, maybe you want just base video, really just depends. Next we are services. These are gonna be all the services and their statuses. Are they started? Are they running? Are they functioning? Our startup, again, Windows 8 and lower, you could do a lot from this menu. You could see the locations of everything that was starting. However, with Windows 10, the startup tab now is done through the task manager, hence why this shows you use the task manager. Lastly are going to be the tools. These are the tools located in Windows and you can actually see all of the tools. You can see the command to load those tools as well as the location of that tool. So really handy when you're trying to customize Windows. Maybe you want to add your own tool or maybe you're looking to repair a tool. This is going to be invaluable for knowing where the tools are as well as being able to launch some of the tools. All right, so that covers some of the more core utilities. What about shutting down? So to perform a proper shutdown, you go to file. Sorry, you don't go to file. You go to the Windows Start button, and you do shutdown. However, if you have things that are open, you want to close them. You do that by file, exit, or file, and close. The important part is when you click shutdown, what happens? Normally, shutdown, when done properly, will close all of the applications. So the computer will close all the user mode applications, and then it shuts down the core functions of Windows. It's going to be focusing on the user mode first, then the kernel mode processes. You can access shutdown multiple ways, alt Control delete alt f 4 Windows, Shutdown, again, lots of options. There are normally three features are three options when you click the power button in Windows. Shut down, restart, or hibernate or sleep. Shut down 
completely turns it off. Restart turns it off and then turns it back on. Hibernate puts it into a sleep mode where all of the user environment settings are stored in a file and the computer goes to sleep. When you wake the computer up, it picks up right where it was left off at. There's pros and cons for each one of them, but realistically, shutdown and restart are the two more common ones used. If you have a laptop, then Hibernate's going to be more, more, more of an option. Alright, so what about processes? When you hit Alt, Control, Delete, it brings up Task Manager. We have our processes, we have our performance, we have our app history, we have our startup, we have our user, we have our details, and our services. So the processes are going to be broken up into two main categories, apps, background processes. Apps are things that you're running. Background processes are things that are running in the background that you also may be interacting with. From there we have our performance, that's going to be our core system, that's going to be our hard drives, that's going to be our, our processor, our memory, our storage, our ethernet. And as you click on them, things like our disks will be read, write, average response time, activity times. I'm copying data while I'm doing this, so it's writing data to the disk. Processors, same thing, it's going to show you the speed, it's going to show you the threads, it's going to show you what it's doing. Memory, same thing, used, available, committed, and what's going on in between. It will show you the speed of memory, all of, the, all of that stuff. App history will be the history of the applications which ones actually have time on them. Things like uh, phone or office, those are the ones that are built into Windows, not so much Office, for example, like Office 365 or the desktop installed version of Word. That's going to be different than this version. This is the mobile or web version. Our startup will be items that are starting up when the computer starts. We can have them list alphabetically or based off of their status. Right now I have these things starting with my PC. If you want to disable one, you right click on it, click on disable. User will be the user logged in. If you uh, drill down, you can see the application that are running. If they're suspended, that means they're not in running anymore, but you can also see the resource usage, processor, memory, disk, network, graphical. I'm doing a recording at the moment, so my recorder, as I'm recording this, is using my GPU. I'm also using a ton of memory in my Camtasia recording. If I sort this, you'll notice that it doesn't do a good job sorting. Okay, I'm clicking on memory, and it's still stuck on just the cumulative total of my user. I wanted to see which application is using the most amount of memory out of this 1900. So we have Dropbox, we have Box Syncing, we have PowerPoint, Camtasia, Camtasia again. As I scroll through this, yeah, those are the ones using the most amount of memory. Details are going to be the services and applications that I'm running. If there is UAC virtualization turned on or allowed, their processor ID, their PID, and lastly are the services. What services are running, if there's a PID associated with it, and the status of that. They also give you a description of what's going on with it. So these PIDs, you can actually correlate back to a running application. So for example, I want to see what's happening with 
PID4388. It says Adobe Update. Under Details, I can sort it, and I can go to 44, sorry, 4388, 4388, 4388. This application, Adobe Update Services.exe, is using processor ID 4388, and that is also tied to that service. This becomes important when we're looking at what services are running and what PIDs they're running on. And that gets more into like privilege escalation and things like that, but that's outside the scope of today's topic. So we've already talked about services. We've already seen kind of how the services function and kind of how they work. We have an extended view and a standard view. So you do not have to see all of the core Windows ones if you don't want to. Standard ones are going to be the common ones inside the system. And again, you'll notice their state. As well as we get a new option, this startup type. So while doing this, this services tab shows you the status. But down here we have the open service option. it opens the services tab. So if we're looking at like Adobe Update, the startup status, you can set it delayed. That means that when it starts, it won't just turn on automatically, it will be, have a delay. You can have it manually turned on or disabled. And you can see the status of the service. You can stop it, start it, whatever. And that it goes for all of them. You can also look at login. if there's a specific user using that service to turn it on, recovery option if the service fails, as well as dependencies. When you click on it, standard, you're going to see these standard services. You'll notice you don't get the, the extended list. You don't get all of the list. The extended list is much further. I want to look at Windows and dollar no you know sure it's a uh, manually started it's currently not running and it will actually use the RPC RPC will then load the DCOM and the RPC endpoint mapper Windows installer is basically used when an application is installed this is a service that will be turned on it's manually turned on when an application goes to install. It will use this service to install the application. Then when done, it will terminate it. Since we are talking about services and threads, we need to be able to discuss memory. So we've already discussed that the processor and the how controls access to memory. But memory allocation and processes we we'll use what's called virtual address spaces. Essentially, the processor will set a address space that something can use. The virtual addresses are not the actual physical location of the memory, but more of a page type that is used to translate virtual memory into the physical address space. We talked about 32 and 64 bit, so we're going to start discussing that a little bit more. Each process in a 32-bit application can only use about 4 gigs of memory. 32-bit, essentially 2 to the power of 32, is just under 4 gigs of memory spacing. Processes that can process a 64-bit command can have 2 to the power of 64, which is a really large number, so you can get about 8 terabytes worth of address spaces. Keep in mind, right now, average computers have 8, 16, 32 gigs of memory. I've had one server do a terabyte of store, uh, memory. It was one terabyte of memory. And the memory itself cost about $60,000. So I mean, eight terabytes is a massive large amount of memory and we're not quite there yet. 
in memory, each user will have their own private space, separate from other user spaces and separate from other processes. That way, what they do in memory in their little realm cannot affect other users for the most part. There's lots of caveats to that, but that's outside the scope of our video. The user space will process uh, what they're allowed. The user space process is not allowed to directly access the kernel's resources. They have to do calls for that. The process will handle provided the access needed to the space provided without directing, direct connections to it. All right, so with that, let's say you have an application that you're running and you need access to uh, the kernel. Well, you don't access the kernel directly. You have to go through the HAL. The other layers control access. You don't. You need access, direct access to the storage the hard drive. You don't get access. You make your remote call through using the kernel. The kernel will forward the calls appropriately to the resource. That way, you, the user, or you, the application that is being used on the user's behalf, never have direct access to the underlying hardware. That keeps it secure-ish, but it also keeps it free from error for the most part. So here we have a RAM map. You can see the things that are being used in memory. You can see how much is used by the kernel, how much is used unused. You can see how much is private spaces, how much of it is not private. And the important part here is you'll see things like kernel stack. You'll see things like driver locked. You can have private spaces for resources. So getting back into some more of the core concepts, after memory, let's talk about our registry. We already talked about two of the big H keys, but registry is way more than just that. Again, the registry will store all the configuration and information about everything on the computer, hardware, applications, users, the system itself, and it's all a huge database. That's called the registry. The registry is a very hierarchy database. At the highest level, it's known as a hive, and underneath the hive, you have keys. And then underneath keys, you have subkeys and so forth. The value stores data, and the data are stored in keys and subkeys. A registry key can be about 512 levels deep, so you can get pretty in there. Here are the core common five hives of the Windows registry. H key or hive key, current user, H key users. And you'll notice this is the name. This is the abbreviation. Name, abbreviation. H key class root, H key local machine, H key current config, so forth. The current user will hold information about the currently logged in user. The HK users hold information about all user accounts. Class root holds things about information objects, as well as linking and embedding registration. It also allows for users to embed objects from other applications. We have our local machine. That's going to be data about the system as a whole. Our current config will be information about the hardware profile that's currently in use. And again, these are the common five. This is not all of them. Here is what the registry would look like. You can access it by going to start and typing regedit, or going to run and typing regedit.exe. And you can see that you drill down based off of what you're trying to access. Everything configuration-wise is here. What starts with Windows starts? What starts your user profile? All of that is in the registry. The registry has multiple components. For example, when you navigate the registry, it's just like any other file explorer. As you're exploring on the left-hand side, the left-hand pane, 
you can drill down content on the right side. The path is always at the very bottom. The registry will contain things like subkeys or values. There's multiple types of subkeys and values. Three of the more common ones are things like the registry binary or the reg D word or the reg string or reg SZ. The registry also will have certain activities that you can perform to do day-to-day -day type stuff. This includes things like the history of the hardware devices. You plug in a USB, you add a new video card, or replace a new uh, hard drive. All of that's stored in the registry. What's connected, what's disconnected, the names, manufacturers, and serial numbers for everything as well. We do have a lab exploring the registry, which for our video is we're going to be skipping. I'm doing separate videos for the labs. So let's talk about the Windows configuration and monitoring section. If you have a file, you can right click on the file and you can run it as an admin. The admin has access for things that will affect the entire system. If what you are doing is not affecting the entire system, then you don't need admin access. It could be a standard user. What's interesting is when you're installing or when you're working with an application, you have two ways to do it. You have the ability to install the application on the system or you have the ability to run the application and that means it won't be installed. So when you're doing things that require admin access, you have a few different ways. You can actually right click on the item and click run as administrator. You can double click on the item and it will prompt you to run it as an administrator or you can do it from the command terminal. But the command terminal would have to be ran as the administrator and you know that would happen by the terminal actually saying administration at the very top. For example, I'm moving up run dialog, typing CMD. Notice this does not say administration, this just says this is the regular terminal. This is a administrative terminal administrator. Also the path is different. And all I did was go to start, type command, run as administrator, and this is I allowed it to come through, and then this is what was prompted. So yeah, the path and the name up here are the dead giveaways. We have our users. They could be either a local user or a remote user. Remote users could also be a domain user. When you first have a computer for the first time and it's local, it's not connected to anything, you typically have a local user. If you have Windows 10, it could also be a Microsoft account and you'd use that when you set up the account. It'll ask you, do you want to use a Microsoft account or a local user? These are going to be, both of them, for this purpose, we're going to choose them as local accounts. They're attached to the local machine. The resource configuration is going to be tied to those users. You can customize them however you want. You can also organize them into groups. We can take those groups and users and apply them to objects however we want. Let's say we have a folder. We can apply permissions based off the user or group this depends on what we want. And our permissions can be allow or deny. If you allow certain things, but don't allow everything, anything not allowed is explicitly denied. If you actually choose the deny option, it will actually deny everything. The deny option is actually really, really powerful. The deny option basically will override anything else. What I mean by that is the most restrictive options take effect. If you have everyone set to deny, but then you have users set to full control, the everyone is to deny. That's the most restrictive, and that's what it's going to be. We can play with our users by typing L 
usrmgr.msc. That will load our snap-in with our local users and groups. There's other ways to access this, but that's one way. You can manipulate the groups, the group memberships, as well as local users at this level. A domain or a domain account is going to be a centralized user that's located on a centralized server called Active Directory. And this is going to be a centralized repository of users. You have oh, users that you log into the computer with, uh, for example, school. Not every system will have your username and password. Instead, they connect to Active Directory, and Active Directory gives them your username and password. If we have to have your name on every single device, that becomes very cumbersome and very difficult to manage. All right, so let's talk about our command terminal and PowerShell. So the CLI and PowerShell, they are slightly different. One's a bash shell, one's a actual full-fledged terminal with objects. So when you open up a CLI, start, type CMD. They are not really case sensitive in Windows, but you do need to pay attention to the slashes. Backslash versus forward slash, they mean different things. You can also tab commands out when you are typing. And I've already done separate videos on both the CLI and PowerShell, so I'm not gonna go into too much depth with our PowerShell. So the environment PowerShell has a command line S type fill. It is a command terminal, it's, it is a terminal. It can use the functions of the command, so you can do things that you can do in the command line, you can do in PowerShell, make directories, navigate, move directories, things like that. However, PowerShell can do more. PowerShell is made up of commandlets. These are commands performed that certain actions and they perform the action and then provide an output. They are powerful. Scripts in PowerShell are designated by a PS1 extension and PowerShell also has functions because PowerShell actually it takes an object and it works with that object. It's not so much interaction with just a terminal, but it's actually doing object-based programming. We have things like uh, action-based nouns. So you do uh, an action or a verb, then a noun. Get help, uh, get command, set help, set command, things like that. And again, I've already done separate videos on PowerShell, so I'm not going too in depth here. We also have the WMI. This is the Windows Management Instrumentation. This is used to manage remote devices. The remote device can have all its regular resources that you can retrieve remotely. So you can pull components, uh, hardware, software, health, logs, all of that. And to do that, you'd access the computer management. And from there, you can open the computer management and expand out services and applications. And you can look at the WMI controller icon and look at its properties. This is what it looks like. And from here, you can pull content. When you open it, you have th four general tabs, general, backup, restore, security, and advanced. The advance is ways to configure it. Security is ways to configure and access. Backup restore is more of a manually backing up content or restoring content, and then general the description. Now keep in mind, WMI does have some security implications that you have to be aware of. And again, way outside the scope of this entry overview video, but it's out there, so we definitely have to be concerned with it. We have our net command, we have our net help, our net view, our net shares. These are things that are going to allow us to work on doing certain things. For example, net account will set passwords and logins. Net sessions will disconnect or connect sessions. Net share helps you to set up shares. Net start and stop will start and stop network services. Net use will connect and disconnect as well as display information about shares. 
and the net view will show a list of computers and network resources on the network that we can view. We've already looked through our task manager pretty in depth. We've gone through all of the different tabs, processes, performance, app history, startup, users, details, and services. We've already done this in a nutshell. When we are looking at certain resources, we also have the resource monitor that we can drill down into. So with our task manager, we have our resource monitor that loads this guy. And you'll notice from here, we have our processor. Processor is going to be processes, services, modules, and handles. We have our memory. And from our memory, we have processes and memory. You can see what's in use, what's available, what's modified, what's in standby. We can look at our disk, and our disk is going to show processes, our activities, and our storage. Each one of these will show you the PID, the location, the reads, the writes, the IOs, the response times. That way you can see what's going on. And network as well. And you can see again sent, received, total. So this is really good when you're looking at detailed specifics. If I see a process that is using a lot of the processor, I can drill down into it and I can see its status. I can see the average time. If I see a, a, an application that's using a lot of disk storage, I'm looking at response time, I'm looking at priority, I'm looking at total bytes written and read. If I see something that is taking up a lot amount of resources, that might be something that I want to look into. So here I have the system. Temp temp records recording.trec that's using a ton of data. Well, realistically, that is Camtasia. I'm making a recording at the moment, so we're seeing as I'm doing the recording, it's writing to that file as I'm recording. So we walked through our overview, our CPU, memory, disk, and network. So if we want to look at additional networking settings, we have the networking and sharing center in control panel. You can see what's connected where. I love that they kind of blurred out their domain. But I mean, if it's a domain, it will be listed there. This one here is the important part, the adapter settings. So you can see the adapter settings. If you click on change adapter settings, it will load this guy. And you can drill down into the adapter. Again, you're going to notice it has these shields. These are part of the UAC. So you have to have admin access. So you can right click on the adapter. You may have multiple adapters depending. You have a wireless adapter, a wired adapter, if you have virtualization, you're going to have a different NIP for each one of them. To see its properties, right click, select properties. That will load the property screen. And realistically here, we're looking at things like IPv4. Down past this will be IPv6. So you can look at the details of them. You can either double click or click once and click on properties. The change settings, again, double click or click properties. And then this will bring up, be brought up. You can use DHCP or you can statically assign them. And you can do that for both the IP settings, IP subnet and the default gateway. That's gonna be basic connectivity or you can do DHCP or static for DNS. And you should have a primary and a backup. You can choose a third one if you click on advanced and add them there. All of this can also be configured via the command terminal by doing a net shell. And there are net shell commands, but net shell commands are way outside the scope of today's topic. So from there, let's talk about some command line. So if we're looking at, let's say netstat, for example, netstat will show you currently what devices are connected, where they're connected to, and their state. 
you can play with some switches so you can also add the PIDs if you want. That way if you start seeing your device and it's calling out to like China, then you may want to look at look at the resource and be like, hey, what's this? And the reason I said, you know, find the one that shows you the PID. If you see something on your local machine calling out to a foreign address overseas, Korea, China, Japan, Russia, what, whatever, outside the US, you can look at the process ID to see what process is using that. So that could be a, a way to look at malware. So this is Netstat. NS lookup will be looking up DNS type commands. And you can see queries based off of DNS using NS lookup. And again, I've already done videos on command terminal uh, options like that. So I kind of went through them fairly quickly because those are all separate videos I've already completed for you. If you're doing a share, you can do the share by sharing a folder. Once you share the folder, people can access it by typing in backslash backslash the user or the server name, the, the name of your device, and another backslash. Hit enter. That will open up the device. Then if you have shared a folder, it will be there. You can click on the folder. From there, you can view the things that were shared to you. This entire path is called a UNC name, Universal Naming Convention name. When you share certain things, there are other items that are hidden. If you do a share and you do a dollar sign at the end, that share is hidden. We can access remote the computers allowing remote desktop or remote assistance. RDP is pretty common when we're talking about remote management of devices. Windows Server has multiple services that are running. Normally, if we want to centralize information, we put it on a server. Normally, we would be doing it through Active Directory. Active Directory has directory services or other domain services to control and centralize resources, usernames, groups, authentication groups. You can add additional features like DNS or DHCP or RDP, virtualization. You can also do file shares or web services like a website or FTP site. So there's a lot of content that you can do with a server. We have a lab covering manipulation of a user as well as PowerShell, as well as Task Manager, as well as monitoring. All of those are separate videos, which I'll be posting a little bit later. Drilling in, let's talk about Windows security. All right, let's talk about Windows security. We already talked about Netstat a little bit, but there's a lot more that we can do with Netstat. Netstat is used to be able to look at outbound connections as well as session states. Here we're using a Netstat TAC ABNO. This is way more in depth than I normally go. I normally just do A, N, and O, but you can add additional switches in here. These are called switches so that we can get more information. Again, local hosts, the protocol, the remote location, the remote address, the foreign address, the state that's happening, and the PID. The PID is important. That way we can see what's calling what. Where are things calling from? So let's try. So there's R. I'm gonna go ahead and do a net stat. Tack A, B, and O. I'm regular command terminal, so I can't do that. I actually have to have a admin terminal. All right, so I have a command, an admin terminal now. So net stat, tack A, B, and O. Ton of information. But the important part is, again, the protocols that are being used, what is actually uh, happening on that, port. 
the foreign address, the state, and again the PID. The PID we can always tie back to our task manager. So you can see that I'm doing, I downloaded some stuff from NVIDIA. So I have an NVIDIA address. I can see my device. I can see the port number that I used and that connected to NVIDIA. And it used that PID. Box sync is connecting to these addresses. And again, these are currently closed and they're not functioning anymore. This is established and they're still transferring data to and from. And again, these are the PIDs that we can verify. PowerPoint is calling out to, the, uh, these ones are time waiting. This one is still showing established. So that's a little, little weird that PowerPoint is calling out to the internet probably calling out to Microsoft. I do have Office 365, so I mean that kind of makes sense, but I would, I'd look into that a little deeper. I'd look at what IP addresses PowerPoint is calling out to because that's a little concerning. And that's the purpose of our tel uh, NetSat command. We can see what's going on. We can see if there is something suspicious that might be happening. Next, we have our event viewer. This is going to be our central location for our Windows logs. And the main logs are going to be application, security, setup, and system. There's four main logs. We can also forward those logs to like a syslog server. And we have additional other types of logs like hardware, Internet Explorer, but these four right here are the most important. Pretty much everything your computer does logs. The nice thing is our logs are timestamped and they normally have a event ID. They also have a user ID. We also have the ability to do our updates. So many modern operating system will have an update option. So that's what we have here. We can do our updates directly from Microsoft. We can patch our Windows applications. We can also download from other Windows 10 machines if we allow it. We can also see what type of updates. Maybe we only want driver updates. Maybe we want security updates. We can also say when to do updates. It's actually a really important to worry about updates because it's desirable that enterprises use some type of automatic update system and verification so they can make sure that up, that the machines are actually up to date. The reason that's important is because attackers will find things that are out of date and they'll use them to attack the organization. So automatic distribution and installation of updates are really important, especially security updates. Normally, if a security update happens, you want it deployed fairly quickly. We also have other forms of management like security policies, whether it be a local security policy or a group based policy issued by a domain. And you can control what's going on with the system through these policies. For example, uh, we could have a password policy that's going to be underneath our local policies. We can set things like password guidelines, lockout policies, lockout reset options, things like that. But through our policies, we can also worry about Windows Defender. We can also worry about installation whitelisting. We can also do and configure most security features from those policies. Uh, locally would be one machine. If we're doing it for an entire network, that'd be a group policy. And that way we can unify or centralize those policies. Windows Defender is going to be the built-in AV and anti-malware um, type tool that Windows has. It does provide antivirus as well as anti-adware uh, type protection. Uh, malicious can also be things like adware phishing, spyware. So our Defender is the built-in tool. 
again may not always be the best but I mean this is the one that comes with Windows so at least there is some protection we've already talked about firewalls so we have a system based firewall or host based firewall and then we also have our network based firewall so we can filter traffic in and out of this computer by using the built-in Windows firewall and that is it for this chapter we talked about our different operating systems, the function of our operating system, our kernel mode, uh, user mode, our hardware, our hardware access, our RAM, our processing types, 32 versus 64 bit. We talked about our registry. We talked about our command terminals. We discussed some centralized servers. And that is it for this chapter. If you have any questions or concerns, please feel free to reach out. Thank you.